Hey, so I don't know if it's comforting or concerning that when I read the Bible, and specifically the book of Psalms, the most common theme is help. I mean, it's praise the Lord and worship and the Lord is my shepherd. But the most common theme is help. I don't know if that's comforting or concerning. It's comforting because, like, I feel that a lot of times in life. I feel like, help, I'm in trouble. God, I need your help. I'm in distress. But it's also concerning that that is the common experience for them as they're seeking God. Life's hard. I may be the only one that feels that has experienced that, but life is hard. And I remember being in a season of life where life was really, really, really hard. And the psalm we're going to look at today, Psalm 134, it's only three verses. Clay read it earlier. Um, somebody spoke from it, just real briefly, just leading a little devotional talk. Uh, Live Oak's really involved with this thing called the Global Leadership Summit, and it's this Thursday and Friday here in town simulcast, and I'm the point leader for Lubbock for it, like help make sure it happens and, and uh, people know about it, things like that. And one of the perks of that is you get to go to this twice a year, or before COVID, now it's once a year, they're getting back on a rhythm, but there was this twice a year gathering where the point leaders would be there, and you get mentoring from different people and different speakers, and and it was, it was great. And this one devotional talk was led by this pastor from Pennsylvania who actually went to Texas Tech. So we had bonded over that because uh, he, he, he went to Tech back in the 70s. And, and he got up and he talked about Psalm 134 we're going to talk about today. And I remember just these three verses that I read and I was like, that was nice. And then he talked about it and I was like, that was just what I needed. In this season of life I was in, I was like, I needed to hear that. And sometimes reading it, you don't hear it. Sometimes we just read over it, skip it, and we just go, yeah, I got it. And so today I want to talk about this, and we're concluding this series called uh, Summer in the Psalms, The Songs of Ascents. These 15 psalms that were their playlist. It was their prayer book. It was their song book. It was their prayers and songs and psalms that they would read as they were going on this journey Three times a year, they would all go to Jerusalem to worship. And it was like, uh, <laughs> the best way I could describe it, probably what one of these festivals was like, was like a religious celebration Mardi Gras. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was like craziness, and people were there, and there's sales and stuff going on, and people are, had traveled forever, and, and everybody was there. It's not like, hey, maybe we'll go to Jerusalem kind of in the fall because it's not so crowded. Everybody went this time of year, these three times a year. Everybody went. It was crowded. It was crazy. And so these psalms kind of helped prepare them for when they got there to remember what they were there for. And in Psalm uh, 120, the songs of ascent start. This is how the road trip starts. Psalm 120, verse 1. I don't have the clicker. You have it? All right. <laughs> so I get, man. What am I doing with my life? We got mic issues last week. And the Psalm 121, the, 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 the playlist starts with, I call on the Lord in my distress. They hadn't even pulled out of the driveway. And they're singing a song about life is hard. Because life is hard. It is. And seeking God is not a detour around distress. But he goes with us through it. And this playlist, their, their songs they sang start, which is a great way to start a road trip, is turning in the right direction. They weren't just going someplace. They were going to someone. This wasn't about an event. It wasn't about a gathering. It was about we're going to worship the Lord. It starts, their road trip starts with a turning to God Repentance, which was where every meaningful relationship with God starts. I'm in distress, either because of what life did, you did, or probably because of what I did. And I need to go in a different direction. I'm turning to God. And that's where this road trip starts. It starts with this turning to God. And then it ends, as they go through, almost all the Psalms are talking to God. And a lot of them are about distress. Some are about my enemies. Some are reminding us what God has done. We're thanking him for what he's done. There's one that reminds people about midway through the trip. Hey, remember, it's good for us to go to the house of the Lord. We're going to worship. 
And then right when they get to their destination, when Siri said, you have arrived, th this is the psalm we looked at last week. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. We're about to go into the city to worship and it's gonna be crazy because it's crowded and crowded brings crazy. It does. And I've been traveling with all of you and I have a lot of grievances with you people. I mean, that, that's how it kind of, that, like, at this point, it's like, hey, let's remind, let's be reminded we're going to worship God, but it's we are going to worship. It's good and pleasant when God's people live together in unity. Where we're in tune with Christ at the center. It's about him, it's not about me. It's about us in tune to him. And they said it's sacred, it's refreshing, it's blessed. And it's a picture of what life will look like evermore, eternity. But it's good for you and it's pleasant, it's, it's, it's enjoyable. And they get to this last song of their playlist. This last song that they sing as they go. And they spent this one psalm saying, hey, remember, instead of fighting with each other, let's fight for each other. Let's fight for a community rather than fighting with. It's not like I'm mad at you and I'm gonna go a different way home or I'm riding on a different mule. And you know, I, I like, 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 like we're, gonna, we're gonna do this together. When we're here and we're not, community matters. Then as they, they're leaving to go home, they have one last song, one last prayer, one last psalm. And it's Psalm 134, it's the one we're looking at today that simply says, praise the Lord. Again, where the journey starts, is a turning to God, repentance. And it ends with praise. Everything is about tuning in and focusing on him. That's what our journey in life's about. Everything that God is happening in life, God wants to use to draw you to him, that he would be the center. And this journey that started with repentance and ends with this invitation and command to praise the Lord or in the English Standard Version and maybe even the better translation based on the Hebrew is, is bless the Lord. Bless the Lord? Well, what do you get the guy that has everything? Like, how do you bless the Lord? It, it, and I think Clay said it simply means to, to speak well of him. To assign worship means to assign worth. This is what I think God is worth and why he is worthy. It's to praise. It's to say, no matter what, I'm gonna focus on worshiping God. Because sometimes we need the prompting and encouragement to do that. Because life is hard and we don't feel like it. And so this song of a sense that life is hard, I'm in distress, I'm in danger. I need God because of my brokenness and sinfulness apart from him. And because my enemies and life is hard. And just the challenge of living with people, they're difficult. It ends with this invitation and command to praise God. But the question is, who is this invitation for? And it's all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. The last psalm in their song of ascents, the last song they sing, and this is probably as they were leaving town, was to the servants, the priest. They were called Levites. The ones who were working around the clock at religious festivals. If they were accountants, it would have been tax season. For priests, it was festival season. Everybody's coming to town and we're gonna be working a lot of hours. And so as the people leave, they look back and they wave goodbye and say, hey, you guys need to praise the Lord too. You're not just the ones that facilitate worship for us. Worship is important for you. Minister by night in the house because they were working round the clock shifts just to get everybody in. And so there's a group of people, the Levites. And Psalm 133 hints about it, talked about oil running down on Aaron's beard. Aaron was Moses' brother. He was consecrated and set apart as a priest. And there was this tribe of Israel called the Levites. And, and they were the ones, they were vocational ministers. So if you're asking, who is this Psalm written to? Well, maybe it's written to you to remind people like me or church staffs or people or elsewhere who are in vocal, vocational ministry, to, you need to remind us, hey, you need to worship too. Because I can't, I mean, I can't speak for the Levites, but ministry, like doing vocational ministry is hard. It's challenging. When I accepted the job to be senior pastor back in 2011 and starting in 2012, 
uh, I looked up the stats. I was, I was trying to figure out, is this what God wants me to do? I shouldn't have looked at the stats that have impacts people who are on church staff, especially senior pastors. The suicide rate is high. The depression rate is high. Divorce rate is high. Affairs, you know, controversy. Uh, just, I mean, right, I mean that, and that was before, the, before COVID. After the pandemic, there's this thing called the great resignation in all, all fields, but even in ministry. And you have a lot of pastors who are getting to retirement age, and there's really not someone to step in their shoes. And a lot of people are going, why would I want to do that? You could say the same thing for teachers right now. Teachers have been through the ringer. So right now, there's a lot of people like going, why would I want to be a teacher? Well, I can so say lead, for teachers, because you're the most strategically placed leaders in our city. Like, we, like wh where else can you have that kind of influence and impact? Like, it, you do that. But you lose sight of that as a teacher. And sometimes you lose sight of that as a staff person. And I just want to brag. I think the staff at Live Oak do a fantastic job. I am so happy with our staff. They, they are great people who care deeply. But I can tell you, they carry a lot of weight. Because they care so much. And they have this deep awareness that we don't always get it right. And sometimes we, we have people that remind us, and that's fine. Remind us that we don't get it right. Talk to us. But sometimes you need to encourage us and say, hey, you, are, how are you worshiping the Lord? How are you taking care of yourself? So, so maybe this is a reminder for you to kind of how you talk to the, the staff. Because we don't have Levites anymore. You know, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 says to pray for your leaders. I hope you're praying for your leaders, all of them, including teachers, school administrators, government leaders, school leaders, leaders of your business. If anyone, a small group leader, if you're in a small group, pray for your small group leader. Sometimes we forget to pray up for people who are trying to lead down and lead well. So we don't have Levites anymore. Maybe it's telling you guys you need to do that for us. I don't think that's the case, though. You need to do all that. But that's not what this is about. We don't have Levites anymore, but we do have this. We do have who this is talking to very, very specifically. And it's hinted at in Psalm 133, talking about Aaron's beard, that unity and community is a sacred space. All you servants of the Lord, these ministers, this is you as well. This is, you need to be reminded to praise the Lord. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, God's plan for you is for you to be a servant of the Lord who ministers. It's not your vocation, but you are a minister wherever God's placed you. Monday morning is your mission field. We don't have Levites anymore. We don't have priests that, that facilitate the worship like they did then anymore. But this is talking about you. Look what... Peter says in 1 Peter 2, as you come to him, as you turn to the Lord, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, talking about Jesus, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy, what's the word? Priesthood. You're a priest. Like Tim talked about it. Like, the, the, the thing God's building, the spiritual house, we are temples of the Holy Spirit. Christ in you is our hope. It's what Paul said. Christ in you. But you're not just the temple. You're a priest, someone who serves God and serves others. Offering spiritual sacrifices expect, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He goes on, and he says, a lot of people rejected it. He said, but you didn't. So if you're following Jesus, he says, he says this to you. You're a chosen people, a royal, what's the word? There it is again, priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. You're a holy priesthood. So what does it look like? That you may declare the praises of him. Praise the Lord, you who ministers, uh, to, uh, servants of God who minister uh, by night in the house of the Lord. That you may declare the praises of him. That's what he does. As priests, we worship God and we serve others. We tell others about him. Once you were not a people, once we were just individuals, but then when we turn to God, now you are the people of God. 
And you're a royal priesthood. So when, it, when, when he's telling us that you need to praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, he's talking to you. Whether you've accepted that role or not, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to serve the Lord and minister always, everywhere, wherever you are. This is not just for people who are Levites, who are priests. This is not just for people who work vocationally in ministry at a church or a parachurch ministry or something like that. This is for people who are followers of Jesus. You are a child of God and a servant of God who serves wherever you are. You don't need a title for your job to do that. Your title is you're a child of God. Your title is you're a servant of the Lord. Your title is you're his special possession, a servant and a minister that may be disguised as a school teacher or may be disguised as a broadcaster or may be disguised as a stay-at-home mom, may be disguised as a grandparent. Whatever it is, wherever you are on a Monday morning, that's your mission field. Serve God, praise him, because that's where it all flows from. But then serve people, reach people. That's who God's called you to do. This psalm is about you. It's for you. So pray for your leaders, but also pray for yourself and know that you are a leader. You are a spiritual leader. When you serve, make sure you're praising God, no matter how you feel, because the weight of the world, the weight of life, and the weight of trying to serve others and reach others can be very, very difficult. No matter how you feel, life is hard, ministry is hard, serving others is hard, but God is good. Nothing about him has changed. He's still worthy worship, worship, worthy of praise. We can still speak well of him, even though I don't have much to speak well of about maybe my neighbor or my life or myself. There's always something to speak well of him about. So I hope you're part of what God's doing in the world, what he's doing in your world, because you are a minister. And he says this, he goes on and says twice in here, first two verses, praise the Lord, and then he says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Like, don't just like think it. Like, do it. Outwardly express it. And you, you may not be a raise up your hands person. I get that. Sometimes it's because like, well, I just wasn't the style I was raised in. Some of it's like, I'm an introvert. I, I, you know, may, maybe it's like, I am just so tired. Do you know how many kids I have? Like, I, I, lifting up my hands, I could barely get my head off the pillow this morning. Like, for whatever reason. But it says, like, take action. Well, I feel like if I did that, I'd be worshiping God. I'm a hypocrite. No. God is good, but we're not. You're focused on him. And he's our hope. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Show up. Respond. And worship leaders, the priests then, the Levites. Spiritual leaders, spiritual servants need to be worshipers first. And I love that our worship arts team talks about that all the time, that, that they need to be worshipers and worship leaders, not performers. And sometimes someone needs to say, hey, lift up your hands. Hey, pray, praise. Because sometimes we don't feel like it. So the first two verses, to the service of the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And then verse three, it says, you know, respond physically. And then verse three says, may the Lord bless you. So remember, praise the Lord probably is best translated, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. And then to these servants of the Lord, may the Lord bless you. Pray for your leaders. Pray for all leaders. It tells us again, 1 Timothy 4, tells us to do that. But pray that God would bless the people who are leading you and leading other places. This is a reminder that sometimes to do something that God wants somebody to do. When they step out, they want to serve God and serve people. They want to reach people. We need to pray that this for them. May the Lord bless you. It reminds us to pray for others and pray for God to bless them. Pray for God's blessing on your leaders, for your leaders, all of them, for each other, for your family. And I think that one of the key things in this psalm is, is it talks about this, this God that we're praying and blessing. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, may the Lord bless you. Who is he? 
he's the maker of heaven and earth. It's all his. Sometimes we take on the weight of the world or the weight of trying to do good in this world and God says, it's mine. I'm inviting you into it. <laughs> but, but you're not a load-bearing way, uh, a wall. You can't handle this. And it's all mine to begin with. So all my resources are at your disposal and everything that's going on in this world, it's about me. He's always at the center. It's all his. You are his. He's seeking people and he's inviting you into his mission. And the psalmist always comes back to this truth that God is good and it's all his. He's the creator, the maker of heaven and earth and the savior who showed up to take the full weight of the sin of the world on his shoulders. It's all his, including the good that I seek to do and hopefully that you seek to do by serving God and serving people and recognize that you're a minister in disguise wherever you go, that you're a priest, a royal priesthood, a servant of the Lord, that as you do that, it's his work, it's not yours. So you need to draw from him and follow him, but also it's not about you. It's about him. And I know, I'm gonna change that. I think that probably the majority of you wouldn't say, yeah, I'm a priest. Yeah, I'm a servant of the Lord. I'm a minister. I'm out there. This is talking to me. I think sometimes in, in faith, we see ourselves more on the sidelines than being the ones who God's saying, no, I'm commissioning you and setting you apart to go out and be a minister in this world. I think a lot of you probably don't buy that. I, and I think you're missing out on something because every day God's at work and he wants you to join him. He wants you to be part of it. And the selling point is not like, hey, by the way, most of the people, they're, they're, they get really tired and they're always in distress and it's hard. And right now we live in a world that doesn't really like what you're doing or what you're saying. Come on, it'll be fun. <laughs> Maybe it's that you don't know that you are. Maybe it's you don't want to do that. I don't know. But I hope you know that God's inviting you in this mission. But for some of you, you've been doing that. You're trying to serve God and serve people wherever you are. Maybe it's in a specific way. Maybe you're in a small group leader here at Live Oak, or you serve in kids ministry or next-gen ministry or college ministry, student ministry, something like that. Or you're serving somewhere in the community. You're, you're trying to reach your neighbors. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're serving and you're like, I just feel like, does it make any difference? It feels like the world's being flooded and I've got a thimble and I'm trying to bail it out. You know, I'm trying to make a difference. I saw this meme of this guy at the beach who's got a mop and he's pushing water out in the ocean and this wave just comes back and he has the mop and he's going like that. And sometimes trying to serve God and serve others and make a difference in the world, it feels like that. There's this interesting piece of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was giving the, the longest recorded sermon he gave, Matthew's chapter, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And as he's teaching this and he's talking about, he's talking about things you do, disciplines you do to connect with God. And in Matthew 6, he says, when you give to the needy, so you're giving time or money to, to those in need, he says, look, don't make a big show about it. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing so that your giving may be done in secret. He's like, don't make this about you. Which if you're trying to serve God, serve people in any way in this world, don't make it about you. But sometimes you feel like, but I don't think I am making a difference. And he has this promise. Then when you do that, your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, when you give of your time and money, and you think no one sees it and no one makes a difference, God says, I see it. And I'm not exactly sure what the reward is, but if he's the maker of heaven and earth, I bet he's got good resources. I'm gonna trust him with that. Then Matthew 6, it goes on to say, but when you pray, so it's not just giving your time and money, it also when you're talking to God, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who's unseen. Like, don't make a big show about it. Because they would have people that go out on the street corners and go, time to pray, and say, uh, everybody look how important I am. And they would get up there and they would pray for a while. And they were like, you're not trying to talk to God. You're trying to get people to look at you. Don't make it about you. And when you pray, just secretly, just between you and your heavenly father, this intimate relationship, he says, then 
Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He says it again. You know, it could be a very terrifying statement to hear God sees everything you do in secret. The good news is we have a God who, I'm glad he saw that because he knows how deeply I need him. That's why Jesus showed up on the cross and grace and compassion is there. But he says he sees all of it, even when I'm just trying to serve him faithfully and I think no one sees it, it's not making a difference. It matters. He sees it. The maker of heaven and earth sees what you're doing. And he celebrates it. Then it says this a little bit later. It goes, when you fast, it's not about speed. Fasting is saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set something aside for a, short, a season. It might be a day, uh, a, a week. Some people have done 40-day fast. And usually when you hear fast, it's about usually food. I'm, I'm going to fast from food. Although modern-day food for us might be technology or social media. A fast from social media might not just be spiritually good for your health. It could be mentally good for your health. Fasting is setting something aside for a season, okay? And theirs, it was usually food. When you fast, put oil on your head. This is not about crude oil. This is not what we talked about last week with sacred oil where they were anointing someone as a priest. Oil was like, hey, don't put on your makeup. Or, 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 or put, put, I'm sorry, put on your makeup. Like, make yourself look good. Don't just go, oh, I'm so hungry because I'm fasting. Don't I look terrible? You know, look at me. It's like, that's what he's saying. It's like, don't make this a spectacle. Like, clean yourself up. So that it will, be it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting. But only to your heavenly father, who is unseen. And that's the challenge. When our heavenly father is unseen, sometimes we think that we're unseen. Or how we're trying to serve him is unseen. And he says, no. Jesus says, no. I can tell you because I know. Your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. He sees. Maybe you serve as a small group leader and like you're, you're there all the time and you just feel like, man, I just don't know if it's making a difference. It is. Maybe you're working student ministry and you show up and you're trying to build relationships with, with a middle school student and you feel like, I just don't even know if it's making a dent. It is. I promise it is. Uh, I'm serving and trying to serve other people where I live and I'm trying to represent Jesus well, but I just feel like it makes a difference. It's, it, it is, but, but here's this. He sees it. And so with those three verses, it's incredibly encouraging that your father sees everything you do to seek to serve him and live out your faith faithfully, whether it be through private spiritual disciplines or serving others, he sees it and it matters. But it almost gets the idea that he wants us to be secret. Don't let people see anything about your faith. Which is the same sermon. Jesus says this. You're the light of the world. That's who you are. You're a royal priesthood, a people of God. You're the light of the world. That's who you are when you follow him. When you're plugged into the maker of heaven and earth, how could you not be a light that shines and reflects him? A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone. Basically, God will strategically place you as a light wherever you are normally in life. You're strategically placed there to be a light. But he just said, pray in secret. Give quietly. Fast and let, don't let people know what I'm doing. That's about motive. Don't do anything with your faith to say, look at me. Instead, what you're supposed to do in the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not about you. It's about the maker of heaven and earth. And how you follow Jesus should be a light to the world that draws people, not to you, but to him. That you shed light on who God is. That's why when we, when we pray, it, and we bless the Lord, it's to speak well of him. Our life of how we live out our faith should speak well of him. The best thing you could do for others, to impact others, is to start by praising God. That your worship, your loving relationship with him, your focus is on him, that that's what everything else draws from. So if you were, if you were to take a summary of the songs of ascents, like, 
you know, there's the last one. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you. We should be saying that to each other because life is hard. And if you're looking at what a summary of the Song of Ascents is, I, th- I think the whole, this psalm is kind of, and looking back through the rearview mirror of the last 14 psalms, is it acknowledges the reality of life is hard, but, but God is good. That never changes. I am a sinner, but I'm forgiven. When I turn to the Lord, repent, when I give him my sin that he came looking for, he came looking for me and saying, you have something that I want to take from you. This sin, my sin. They become aware on the journey that they desperately need God, but they probably don't deserve it. That's why grace and mercy are so important. I'm a sinner, but I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God, but I'm not an only child. How good and pleasant it is when God's family dwells together in unity. That only happens when we get in tune with him. And then this last one is, I'm doing something that matters. Your heavenly father sees what you're doing. It makes a difference. It matters. The problem is we can lead from contrary feelings. I don't know if God's good. Doesn't feel like it because life's hard. I'm in distress. I don't recognize it. And quite honestly, there are very three very real threats to you being a disciple who follows Jesus well. Life is hard. It's difficult. And I've said it before. I'll say it again. I told my daughter last night, the worst advice in the world is follow your heart. (laughs) Because what Jesus tells us is that my heart is broken and fallen and sinful. The heart is deceitful. It does not tell me the truth. And when I'm discipled by my flesh, by my heart, the journey's not going to go well. We have a spiritual enemy. The Bible speaks that we have a spiritual enemy attacking all the time. Life is hard. And we have a world that wants to disciple us. And if Jesus doesn't sit in that seat as our discipler, we're going to look a lot like the world. We're going to lose our spiritual battles. And we'll follow our hearts wherever it takes us. And then look at God like, why have you led me here? Life is hard, but God is good. We lead from the wrong thing sometimes. But when we lead from this idea that there is a God, and it's not me, but he is good, he is forgiving, he's a great leader. And even though I don't get along with my spiritual family, my brothers and sisters, I'm a child of God, but I'm not our only child, and that's a good thing. And when I step into that idea that I'm going to serve God, I'm doing something that matters. Not because I'm doing it, but because it's his. I want to challenge you to step into what God's doing. And maybe for you, you're at a place where you're like, I just need to do the repent thing. Like I've been following myself. I'm, I'm in, like, I need to turn to him. I need... Like, like we read in Acts, like turn to the Lord that times of, refresh, of refreshing may come. Like I need that. I need to just say yes to follow him. I need to start the journey of following him. Or maybe some of you have been doing it for a while and maybe you need to pray for your spiritual leaders. Maybe that's your next step because we believe everybody has a next step. Maybe you need to step up to be a spiritual leader. The world needs spiritual leaders who recognize that it's all his. It's not about me, it's about him but also who recognize it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult. But God cares about people so much that he sent his one and only son and then he sends us. He says, I want you to be part of what I'm doing. And as long as you keep turning back to me, praising the Lord, focused on him, that he's the source we draw from, we have something to offer the world. If we don't have him to offer to the world, we have nothing. Jesus is everything we have to offer, and it's enough. But it starts with it needs to be enough for you. Because following Jesus is hard. This is not an easy journey. 
So those are the songs of ascents. And next week, we're going to continue with Summer in the Psalms. We finished their playlist. Now we're going to kind of do a greatest hits of the Psalms, so to speak. Uh, we're going to do four uh, just selected Psalms. The first two are from David um, and, and then two other ones. And I encourage you to be here for that. The Psalm next week is Psalm 19, if you want to read it ahead of time. And it asks three very, very important questions that David asked himself that we're going to ask ourselves as well. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thanks that when life is overwhelming, when we feel the weight of life, that we become very aware that we're in distress and we need help. When I feel the weight of my sin, I became very aware that I need help. What we need is you. Thanks that you don't just say, I'll forgive you and save you and redeem you, but you say, I'm gonna make you into a family, a people. And you even describe us as a royal priesthood. You want us to serve others faithfully, representing you in this world. God, thanks that you are the maker of it all. It's all yours and you're with us. Help us to follow you faithfully, represent you faithfully, and let our light shine in a way that it speaks well of you, shines light on you, and when it gets difficult, help us to be mindful, to be praying for our leaders, praying for all leaders, and praying for ourselves that we would recognize that you see us as leaders spiritually in this world, wherever you've placed us on a Monday. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for being here. If you'd like to talk, I'll be down at the front. <laughs>